as a teacher, I love making connections between things that people would read in an actual history textbook and things that my students can look outside the classroom window or walk down the street and say, wow, those two or three events are connected. So what you're going to see is some research that I've been doing uh, or that I did for my second book and um, that's partially for my third book as well. So real quick, classroom teacher, show of hands. Uh, anybody want to raise your hand if you know a Revolutionary War event that happened fairly close to this area? To this area? To this area, yeah. yeah. I love Valcor Island. Okay, Valcor Island, yeah. Valcor Island isn't that far away across the lake. Good. Anybody else? A Revolutionary War event that happened. Ticonderoga. Okay, Ticonderoga. It's in New York. We associate it with Vermont history quite a bit. I mean, you're talking all of New York Vermont. Too? Yeah, Valcor is <laughs> on the New York side of the lake. Yep. Battle of Saratoga. Battle of Saratoga. Yeah. So I was shocked to learn that there is a lot of Revolutionary War history that happens right here in Vermont. So the Battle of Bennington actually didn't happen in Vermont. It's about five or six miles into New York. There's the Battle of Hubbardton, which um, happens kind of southeast of Ticonderoga and Mount Independence. But when I started to do a lot of research, I found that um, my home area is connected to the Revolution. And there are some characters that we read about in the history books that are in this area. Uh, and it's not just Ethan Allen or Ira Allen. Uh, Benedict Arnold, Ben Franklin, all of those guys are, are up here in the area. So as a high school teacher, I uh, do occasionally have to um, show a couple of different things. I, I want to give this book credit, um, Benedict Arnold's Navy. This is the book that talks about the Battle of Valcour Island. And it starts to give Benedict Arnold uh, a little bit more credit than he's been due. I think a lot of people identify Benedict Arnold as the most notorious traitor in American history, and that's correct. But um, let's just say that Benedict Arnold's contributions to the American Revolution got the colonials to the point where they could win the war. Um, and that's a point that I'll make a little bit toward that you'll see as we go through the presentation. I also want to use a term very quickly you're going to hear me say it a couple times, nerd mode. So um, I'm a nerd, and I celebrate it. I am up at 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the morning, sometimes going through files or reading historical texts, and I can't help it. I love it. Um, and I hope I inspire my students to do the same thing. If you guys are doing research, or if there's a research vein that you fall in love with, like latch onto it. If it's genealogy, take it as far as you can, um, because discovering the past is it's been a joy for me, and I hope other people can enjoy it as much as I do. So, uh, Northern Vermont in the War of 1812, that's my first book, The Hidden History of Franklin County. That's the book that just barely came out. And my next book is going to be Northern Vermont and the American Revolution. And that's really the chapter, uh, second or third chapter of the book that I just wrote. But now the history press has um, agreed to take a look at it in book form. So, as a classroom teacher, I know a lot of people kind of knock education every once in a while. These are the class, these are the standards that I would apply my history research to in the classroom. Uh, inquiry, problem solving, history, geography, civics, economics. You're going to get a lot of these today. You may not get too many of these. But I just wanted you guys to see this as a classroom teacher. Ta taxpayers should see um, how history teachers are taking research and applying it to the classroom. So some of the research questions that I started off with uh, with Swanton so close to Lake Champlain, Battle of Balfour Island, um, what role could it have played in the American Revolution? What sources are available? How could I research this and find out what role Swanton played? Uh, and should Swanton's role in the American Revolution receive a little more attention? Now I'm using Swanton as a sort of a focal point for northern Vermont or northwestern Vermont. Um, but you'll see that there's a lot that goes on. And if I had three hours, I would love to share all of my information with you. So as a classroom teacher, uh, I just wanted to show you some of the things that I do with my students. Anybody know what that is? It's a flint, it's a flint and a steel. Flint and steel. So you, it's a fire starter. 
Uh, so my students will go, go outside and without matches, because matches aren't invented until after the revolution. Um, I'll have my students try to start fires with birch bark, cattails, uh, fuzzies, stuff like that. And generally speaking, uh, I'll try to give the students the backstory of the American Revolution and uh, starting the fires. And it's something that they enjoy. They enjoy doing this a lot more than taking the test or shoes. So uh, real quick, also try to use maps as much in the classroom as possible. Um, United States, or what will become the United States. This is Quebec, owned by France until the French and Indian War. This is uh, the British colonies. It's like a radio interview. <laughs> um, and all of this changes after the French and Indian War. Because France loses, and England gets the American colonies. Um, I also want to put a plug in, uh, if you'd like to read, there are a lot of books about the American Revolution. Bellico is one of the best. In his book, uh, he nicely sets up to some primary sources a lot of different locations. So obviously, during the American Revolution, a lot's going to happen in Boston. Stuff happens in New York, Quebec City, Montreal. Well, if you sort of center that, you know, Lake Champlain is here, and there's a lot with the American Revolution that is kind of unknown that happens in our neck of the woods. So, um, Skeensboro, uh, Philip Skeen is a gentleman is, who's down at the southern part of Lake Champlain. He's on the New York side. The New York settlement system was a little bit different than what New Hampshire had. It was a manorial system where basically you had one wealthy character set up and then a lot of people would sort of pay their tax or they would live on his land. New Hampshire had a different arrangement where it was more about private property. And through that private property, that's how um, Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys became somewhat upset with the idea that New York might uh, actually have control of the Green Mountains. So maybe this shows it a little bit better, but Skeen or Skeensboro is down here. This would be in the location of Fort Ticonderoga, and this is uh, Pound Point here. So much of the research that I've been doing sorry, is up here, and I want to uncover, um, with all of the stuff happening down here around Ticonderoga, what's happening up in, in our neck of the woods. By the way, any questions? If anybody has any questions during the presentation. You, you shot over French and Indian War. Uh, I want to ask you this. Yeah. It seemed to me this fellow, Robert Rogers, um, he captured Detroit for the English against the French. And it seemed to me he jumped in the Missisquoi River outside of Highgate to, to, to pioneer a canoe all the way to Detroit through the Great Lakes to take this take the city. Mm. So I don't have a lot of information about anything that would have happened out west. Okay. I, I know Highgate and Franklin are, and Missisquoi are directly related to Roger's raid. Right. Because that's when he goes up to Odenak and, right. and right. goes after the Abnaki up there. Okay. Yeah. Right. But, so I don't have a lot of information. All right. Okay. Any other questions? So again, uh, just to kind of so we are here, and we're giving this presentation, or you're part of this presentation, right kind of in the center of the lake. Well, uh, Skeensboro, Fort Ty, St. John's, this is an area that's going to be big during the American Revolution. And then uh, Swanton it was actually settled during uh, the French and Indian War. And some of the folks who set up in Swanton during the French and Indian War or after the French and Indian War they're in Swanton about the time of the start of the American Revolution. So um, I don't own a boat, but I love naval history. Uh, the naval history of Lake Champlain is amazing. One of the things that Ethan Allen is interested in a little bit, but something that Benedict Arnold is very interested in, are some of the boats that are on Lake Champlain at the time. This is not a military boat. In the previous slide, that fellow Philip Scott in the mineral system, he owned so much land in New York, and he was so wealthy that he was actually able to build this boat. And at the time, in the late 1760s and the early 1770s, early 1770s, this is called the Catherine. And Benedict Arnold is very interested, not really in Fort Ticonderoga, but he's interested in controlling Fort Ticonderoga, the cannon that are at Fort Ticonderoga, and the boats that are on Lake Champlain. 
so another way that I try to get my students involved is I ask them to uh, imagine some of this stuff. And this is just some artwork of what they would imagine some of the boats on Lake Champlain would look like. Another great book, uh, this is a children's book, but it does do a great job of showing where the British units were and how big the British units were at the start of the American Revolution. So Montreal is up here. This is Quebec City, Crown Point, Fort Ticonderoga. This um, particular book, Quebec, 1775, it gives the total number of British soldiers at every outpost. Fort Ticonderoga was actually not a very well-manned outpost. I think there's only 50 or so British soldiers when Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys and Benedict Arnold take it. Uh, but this also gives some of the other. Um, there are about 100 soldiers at St. John. Again, that's just north of us. 50 at Chambly, Chambly, and then about 250 um, in Montreal. So again, as I start doing my research and I see stuff like this, I'm like, well, Swanton's up here. What, what, is there any chance that Swanton or northwestern Vermont is linked to what's happening in the revolution? Could you focus on that? Oh, sorry. How's that? Because it's in the march. No, it's not. Fort Ticonderoga, how many people have been? That is pretty neat to go and see how the fort has been reconstructed and to try to imagine what it would have been like 250 years ago. So the first place that my research started was with the Swanton Town History Book. Uh, most of your communities probably have a town history book, whether or not it's Burlington and the Gazetteer or Colchester. Uh, I think Colchester has its own town history book. I started with the Swanton Town History Book. And then the Swanton Town History Book, um, as you read through the Swanton Town History Book, there were a couple of references to people who uh, were around during the American Revolution. And with my students, I would highlight some of that information. And to give history its due, the other thing that I try to emphasize is the native presence. So um, up in Swanton, the Abnaki community, the Swanton history book through oral histories, uh, it's written in 1871. So it's almost 100 years, or about 100 years after the American Revolution. So the folks who wrote the Swanton history book, they're actually relying on oral history. They're talking to some of the elderly people in town, and these are the names of the Abnaki that they come up with who were in Swanton about the time of the American Revolution. Um, I, I just think it's, it's interesting, and I think it's nice for my students to see that if we, when we talk about the American Revolution, we can also talk about the Native presence. OK, family fathers. Um, there's no. Even though all of us have cell phones and we can take out our cell phones and take a picture really, really fast, the only reason why we have the likeness of any of the founding fathers is why. They were wealthy enough to have portraits taken. Yeah. They had the money to be able to pay somebody to paint them or sketch them. And then those paintings or those sketches are what survive. And that's how we know what Ben Franklin looks like and George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. Um, we don't know what a lot of the average per average people or average persons would have looked like. And that's also something that I try to get my students to imagine. So in Swanton, probably the person you're going to hear more about in this presentation than anybody else is a guy by the name of Simon Metcalf. And in some, rep in some sources, it's called Metcalf. Metcalf is the actual name. Uh, there's a reference in the Swanton history book to him owning a piece of land called Metcalf's Island. Uh, and he does business with somebody called James Robertson. And then there's some other information. So some students who are artistically inclined, um, I would say, hey, since George Washington has a portrait, since John Adams has a portrait, Simon Metcalf doesn't. Do you want to try to imagine what Simon Metcalf would have looked like? So this student was kind of on the young side, but that's what my student thought <laughs> Simon Metcalf <laughs> might look like. <laughs> Now, this student knows that I do these presentations. I have permission to use the image. This student has also said, uh, I think I want to change that picture of Simon Metcalf to make it look a little more uh, 17 or 1800s. 
So that guy, James Robertson, he's a businessman up in Quebec. We don't know what he looked like, but I asked that student to try their hand again. It was the next year later. And now we have a pretty good image of what James Robertson would have looked like. And one more in the Swanton History Book, there's this guy by the name of General Bailey. And General Bailey is over in the area of Newberry on the eastern side of the lake, or eastern side of Vermont. So my students now have, through their own work, um, faces that they can apply to certain names that I'm learning are associated with northern Vermont history and the American Revolution. So Metcalf probably made his first beginning in this neighborhood as a trader. So later on in the Swanton History book, it mentions that there's a place called Metcalf Island. So the northern part of Lake Champlain, <coughs> some of you may be familiar with the location up in New York called Rouse's Point. This would be Alberg over here. And over here, you have Swanton. So <coughs> there's a place on our Google Maps today called Metcalf Island. So immediately as a classroom teacher and with my students, I'm asking, all right, guys, ladies, why do we have this place called Metcalf Island? And Metcalf Island is a remnant of the folks who were around during the American Revolution. So even Google Maps can be a source that we can use to make some connections. So then I got to be thinking, I got to thinking, well, if he, he has an island named after him, is there anything else in the area that could have Metcalf's name on it? Anybody know where I'm going with this? There's Metcalf Pond in Fletcher. Metcalf Pond. So by the way, this is an aerial view. Um, my cousin, uh, Armin Messier, with Northern Vermont Aerial Photography, he has a drone. Uh, and this is what uh, the front or the top of Missisquoi Bay looks like. Metcalf's Island would be literally here in the center at the end, and this would be a location where he was trading with the natives. Um, also, I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that I'm uh, a fan of my administration, that I get along with my administration. Um, Dan Palmer and Jay Hartman at MVU, they encourage me and some of the other social studies teachers to take kids out on field trips as much as possible so that they can see some of these locations. And there's this place-based education is something that I'm really in favor of because if you ask a student to go on a field trip, they're probably going to remember that field trip more than taking notes or taking a quiz or doing a test. So Metcalf Pond, I'll get to Metcalf Pond in a second, sorry. So Simon Metcalf was a map maker in upstate New York. Have any of you been through Swanton or in Swanton? <coughs> um, so this would be the area where Merchant's Row is here. This would be where the bridge is. And then this road would take you over to Alberg and Rouse's Point. So Metcalf was a map maker. This is a map. Nobody knows where this map is today. But this is a map that was printed that shows what Swanton and the Missisquoi River looked like in 1772. So the original question was, does Swanton have any association with the American Revolution? And now we have a map that shows exactly what Swanton looked like right before the revolution broke out. I was trying to find out where that map actually was, but we don't have it in there, so So one of the things I would do with my students is I would ask them just to observe this map. If you guys were in my classroom, I would project this, and then I would say, write everything down. Observe the map and write everything down. And some students would be like, well, I don't know. There's a lot happening there. But they're immediately, almost always, they notice that Missisquoi is actually spelled differently um, on this map than it is on a lot of, a lot of other maps. Um, we finish it with a K, right? But this is Q-U-E. Um, and then if you're observing and you take a look at the map long enough, you'll notice that there's a key over here or an ex exclamation. So explanation. So it's hard to see, but a lot of these buildings actually have numbers that are associated with them. And now we actually know, based on analyzing the 1772 map, what some actual buildings were <coughs> as the American Revolution is about to break out. Any questions? Do you use genealogy in your class as well? Um, I, I have a little bit, yes. Um, but uh, 
I've only focused in on the Barney genealogy. Uh, find, selfishly, I can't get beyond the Barney genealogy. <laughs> is that um, Toluca Falls? Is that where the where the dam is now? Yeah. So I think it's pronounced Takwahunqua Falls, oh. and um, that's literally where the dam is in Swan. Yes. And uh, so I want to show you something which I think is pretty cool. Uh, so that's where the dam is. That's the dam in Swan. <coughs> But this is the Google Maps view. The Siskoi Valley Union High School is up in the top right-hand corner. That's not within walking distance, but we can take a bus ride there in about five minutes. And uh, I showed this to a, a group of students when I was experimenting with what I could do with old maps and what I can do with new maps. And I just want to show you something that my students responded fairly positively to. So that's the bend in the Mississippi River. This is one of Armin's drone footages, uh, uh, photos. Um, that is the, the dam and the small bridge that goes over from the Stampers area. So, Google Maps View, 1772. Was Simon Metcalf a pretty good map maker? Yeah, yeah. awesome. It's not exact but it's probably better work than I could do for my students. I mean, that's, especially the path, of, look at the path of the Sisboy River. It's almost exact. And he wasn't using an aerial view. No, <coughs> no, absolutely not. So the falls have been somewhat altered since 72. Yeah, so um, I would love to do some um, archeology span in the area of the falls, but the problem that Burlington has, the problem that Winooski has, Colchester, Swanton, there's been so much development in these areas that anything that is in this area has probably been, because that's not the first bridge. The original, there's like three or four bridges that have been there as well. And then there was, um, a, a, not the Barney family, my family, but there was Barney Marble Mill, which is down on the right hand side, and they developed this entire area. So the idea that you or I could do any archeology span and find out like I would want to do that, but I don't know what we would find because it's been uh, it's been gone over so much. So these roads, uh, roads it, before the American Revolution are not in good shape. They're like walking paths more than anything else. But you notice that Metcalf included these roads on this map. These roads really don't connect well to any other location in Vermont. They're logging trails where because Metcalf owns a sawmill. Uh, one goes up into the area of Francisco Bay. But with Google Maps and with PowerPoint, one of the things that you can do is you can overlay. So my students are definitely more familiar with the view on the right-hand side. So take a look at the left side, the Metcalf map, and then take a look at the Google Maps view. And you're gonna, one of the things that I was playing around with, and my, my students said that this, they thought this worked fairly well. So I've blown up that curve in the Mississippi River. See that little yellow line that's basically where the bridge is on the Google Maps view? Mm -hmm. What I've done is I'm assuming that that's where the road coming up from that building, let's, let's assume that that's the sawmill. Does everybody see it? Mm -hmm. So watch as I go through the next couple of slides. Because what I try to teach my students is you can literally dissect where these people were walking almost to the foot as you move this forward. That yellow building, I'm assuming that's going to be Metcalf Sauna. And this is some of the artwork that is featured in my current book, uh, Hidden History of Franklin County. I'll just say a comment about this. This sawmill gets burned during the American Revolution, but we really don't know by who. How much commerce is between the people in, in this area and those in Quebec area? Um, so, the, did everybody hear the question, how much commerce is between Swanton, at the time it was called Prattsburg, because this is a New York land patent, it's not a New Hampshire grant land patent, <coughs> and the Quebec area. Um, my guess is that Metcalf is not trading with anybody to the south. He's not trading here, he's not trading with Ticonderoga, he's no, not, he's trading, he's trading north. He's trading all of his goods with Quebec. The Richelieu River is that um, small, point that goes uh, north of Alberg and Rouse's Point. Um, 
all the anything he cuts as far as trees are going up and down the Richelieu River. So and, he, and that trading post on Metcalfe Island. So um, a dollar amount, I don't know. I I, I couldn't. No, no. But the lumber would have been very valuable. So yeah, question. Now our Allen purchased a lot of land up in Swanton. Uh, did he not? And when? What time period was this after? After the time that you're talking about right now. So uh, not to give too much of a plug, but uh, in Glenn's book, at the end of that book, uh, I, it's good. There was some. Um, one of the final chapters he details uh, where Ebenezer Allen has to go into Swanton because the Abnaki have returned. Uh, they had left during the war, um, and it's during that time period that Ira Allen must have purchased the land. Uh, that's some research that I'm finishing up right now. Um, we're talking, so if this is 1772, your question probably points to like 1784, 1785, somewhere in that range. So we'll just finish building some roads here on the Google Maps here. And literally, you can see where the roads would parallel. And my students can easily walk some of these locations and see where the revolution was unfolding or where, where it was about to unfold. And then one more. It's not 100% accurate, but I just think it's a way for the students to sort of pay attention when we go outside. All right, Metcalf Pond. So um, it's also mentioned in the Swanton History book that um, the name Metcalf is on Metcalf's Pond. So if we just apply a little bit of space to this, where we are at the Ethan Allen Homestead is off the bottom of this map. Isle of Mont, Albert, North Hero, Maquam. Metcalf's Island and Trading Post would be up here. Metcalf's Pond is all the way down there. So just from, now I'm making an assumption. Somebody could do some research and prove me wrong. But I'm assuming that that's the same Metcalf. There's one other bit of research that it was just a week ago that I, it was like a light bulb going off. Has anybody ever heard of Metcalf's Hill? It's in the eastern part of Chittenden County. Um, south of Metcalf's Pond, there's a Metcalf's Hill. And I haven't done any research on that yet. On Google Maps, it says it's in the area of Jericho or near Johnson. Um, and I need to do some research. But I wouldn't be surprised if Metcalf is logging all of this area that he is um, at least down at Metcalf's Island at Pond, and then doing some, some other research too. How are we doing on time? Okay, I'm going to hold this to an hour, so we've got about 24 minutes. So if there's any questions, feel free to ask. So all of the stuff that I mentioned, folks, the Revolutionary War hasn't even started yet. And we already have a pretty good idea of what Swanton looked like in 1775. So um, Metcalf um, made maps. And something that the homestead is directly tied to is uh, the New Hampshire grants, the Allen family, and what was happening at the time. Metcalf was from New York. New York also had its land claims in the New Hampshire grants. Uh, Albany County and Charlotte County were the two names that they gave. This is a map that Metcalf made in 1772, um, which shows what the New York land claims work. And uh, I'll kind of condense this. Uh, Dan O'Neill, the director of the homestead here, he had actually given me um, the link to the language of what the Prattsburg town charter was. So it wasn't called Swanton back then. It was called uh, Prattsburg. And Met Metcalf's name is all over that document. So I'm going to blow up this map a little bit so that, oh, sorry. I would, I would ask my students some research questions at this point in time. Uh, is there any chance that Metcalf was in the Missisquoi area before 1768? Uh, do other maps exist? Um, there's some research that the Canadian border was actually chopped into the forest in 1771, 1772, and that Metcalf may have actually been making money off of that. Um, something that um, I think is a very touchy subject to bring up now, but I think even though it's touchy, it's something that we just bring up and we talk about because we all have views of American history. If Metcalf is a New Yorker, there is a substantial chance that Metcalf owned slaves in Prattsburg or in Swanton. Now, I say that's touchy, and some of you may think, well, whatever. 
But I think a lot of us have a view, sort of a Civil War view, that slavery was in the South, that slavery really didn't happen in New England. That's just not true. We got rid of it sooner or earlier than uh, the states of the South did. But um, I'm not saying that Metcalf did have slaves in Swanton, but he does own a slave, or his family owns a slave in, 17, in the 1790 census. So Philip Skeen owned slaves. Another guy, uh, Gillibrand in New York, he owned slaves. Is there a possibility that Metcalf owned slaves? There's no proof, but my guess would be that he probably did. Would he have enslaved Abnaki? Um, that didn't work out so well because of the because disease. There. Because yeah. of the disease factor as well. Yeah. Um, but he did employ a lot of French Canadian uh, and Abnakis at the Sodom. Um, Metcalf's name on any other land tracts uh, and Townsend, that's just another. So if you take a look, when you blow these things up, you sort of lose resolution a little bit. But you can see where Prattsburg is here. And I'm just fascinated by this town, Townsend, that probably is in the location of like Sheldon, Enosburg. Um, if you look at the land grant um, history, Metcalf's name is actually on that land grant as well. So, any questions so far? Yeah? What, are, what is the source, or more than most source, of the Missisquoi Mis River? Does it go well up into? Um, I'm assuming this area here would be the towns of like Troy and Jay. Yeah. Uh, and it crosses the border. This is fairly accurate. It actually crosses the border in a couple of different locations yeah. and then comes back. Yeah. And the town of Franklin, which is much closer to the Missisquoi Bay area, the Missisquoi River actually isn't much of a river at all. It's, it's a very, very thin creek. Uh, but when you get into Swanton, you have a lot more of these small tributaries coming in and, and the rivers. Much more. So there wouldn't have been much of a source of trade or commerce coming down that route? Canoes, even this time of year, could have made it, yeah. Maybe they would have been able to move logs that they... Well, nothing major. No, no, no. No, like between factories, like all the... Uh, no. Well, even this portion of the Missisquoi River, right here in Missisquoi Bay, yeah. this time of year, there are portions of the river that are more than two or three feet deep. It, it's a big river by Vermont standards. But this time of year, the water is so low. I actually saw that this time of year, you put so long. Right. Yeah. 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 We should tell you, maybe one of the deeper questions from the Okay. Are you going to speak right now? No, good. At what time, at what point in the revolution did the New York land grants that encompass swan convert to New Hampshire? So uh, the question is, uh, um, at what point did the New York land grants basically get converted to Vermont? So uh, something that I'm researching quite a lot right now is when that transfer happens. And I don't know how much individuals in the room know about Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys, but that land uh, individual, that, that land owner that I mentioned earlier, Philip Skeen, um, Apparently, Allen actually had a very good relationship with Philip Skeen, even though uh, there's others that he literally goes to war with down in the area of Bennington. Um, Philip Skeen had the chance to have him arrested a couple of times and didn't. And there's one instance where actually Ira Allen is coming up here. Uh, and uh, I found one source where Ira Allen actually left from Philip Skeen's estate to come up before they built the blockhouse that becomes Fort Frederick, I think is, is the name of it up here. So Philip Skeen, for whatever reason, so to answer your question though, uh, it's not until after the revolution that it gets settled all the way up here. Okay. So uh, Metcalf is in and out of Swanton during the during the revolutionary war. So again, with my students, I'll take the Google Maps view. Uh, notice those lines. I'm going to come back to those lines in a second. Those lines are on that Metcalf map that I just showed you. All right, Lexington and Concord. Uh, that happens down in the area of Boston. Uh, the shots heard around the world. Those shots have a real significant uh, impact on the flow of history up here. So define local history. This is something that I, I mentioned with my students. 
uh, I'll just ask you guys, if you were a teacher, um, how far or how close would you define something as local? Is it within the boundaries of your town? Is it within the boundaries of your county? Five miles? Ten miles? What's local today was not local then. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Yeah, I left St. Albans 30 minutes before I got here. Yeah, that was, <laughs> this is local, right? Um, so my students often say five to ten miles. They'll say something's local, truly local, if it happens five to ten miles. So as a teacher, uncovering some of this stuff, I go into nerd mode, trying to let them know that there's revolutionary war stuff that happens within five or ten miles of where they're being taught. So this is the north, northern section of the lake. Uh, if you get into Revolutionary War history, there's a point of fur in upstate New York. There was actually a Revolutionary War small fort that was built uh, by a loyalist, sort of. Um, he ends up changing sides, but it's, uh, it's in this location. Uh, number two, when the American Revolution um, starts, Benedict Arnold, he takes that ship called the Catherine, from Fort Ticonderoga and Skeensboro, he goes up Lake Champlain into the Richelieu River, and he steals another ship up at St. John. Uh, Ethan Allen kind of follows him, and Ethan Allen is up at St. John. Just a little bit later on, uh, Arnold is back at an island uh, that is a fort now. Today it's called Fort Lennox, but it's histor in the history, history books, you'll hear it referred to as Ile Noir. Uh, has anybody ever heard of Re Remember Baker? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What, what, what do you know about? Do you remember? Know anything about Remember Baker? He, he's a, is he a, a cousin of Ethan Allen. He, yeah, I don't know like, what the exact family relation or, is, or but uncle or something like that. Yeah. But it was they, they were they were together in, in certain aspects during the Revolutionary War when they were, I guess, fighting the British in that area. Yeah. Yeah. So. This is right after the taking of Fort Ticonderoga. Right. Ticonderoga is May 10th. So throughout June and July, the American forces are patrolling all in here. And remember, Baker is running spy missions all up here on the Canadian border. He's in Isle of Mont, he's in Alberg. In one instance, he's over here at Missisquoi, and he's visiting Simon Metcalf. There's a letter that's a, it's at the um, Northern Illinois digital library. You can find these primary sources online. And remember Baker actually visits Metcalf in Frasburg. And then there's another guy, Bayes Wells. He goes on a spy mission up to Quebec to see exactly what the British defenses are. And he actually comes around Missisquoi Bay and he, he keeps a, a journal. And he mentions that he's at Metcalf's at the end of that spy mission. Metcalf gives them a canoe and they're able to go back down to the southern part of Lake Champlain. Fort Ticonderoga, Crown Point. So now, if I'm with my students, we can't go into Canada for two, three, and four because of COVID, but one, five, and six are fair game because those are all the trips that my students can take. Um, so the two ships, Liberty, that was the Catherine, the ship that Arnold steals up in Quebec is the Enterprise. And this is some more artwork that is in the hidden history of Franklin County. This is uh, from an MBU teacher uh, this is the Bay, Bay's Well spy mission. That's supposed to be one of the curves in the Missisquoi River as the American spies are leaving Quebec. So going back to Google Maps, again, how much stuff happens local? Well, we got to number six. Baker returns to Isle of Mont. Uh, we haven't even invaded Canada yet. Like the Canadian invasion isn't unfolding. Uh, Bay's Wells actually comes back up to the Missisquoi Bay area. Uh, number 10. The USS Liberty delivers a spy up to an area just north of Windmill Point. Remember Baker dies. He's the first death of the American invasion of Quebec. He dies about six miles north of Albert, and it's a fairly grisly, uh, uh, gruesome, uh, grisly account. Does anybody know how he dies? Well, he was beheaded. He was yeah. Beheaded. Yeah, he was beheaded. Um, they don't know if it was Abnaki, but it was. English allied Indians north of the border. And then 12, uh, Isle of Mont, um, the entire American invasion of Quebec lands on Isle of Mont in August of 1775. It's about 1,200 soldiers. And when they're going to invade uh, Quebec, they use Isle of Mont as 
the sort of super highway up through uh, as a vein to, to go north. So, any questions? Yeah. Was that Ethan Allen's invention? So, Allen, he tried to take Montreal, but he only had like 30 minutes. So <laughs> yeah. So, Allen is a part of this invasion. He comes up after the main invasion force, and they take this island, that's Ile Noir, and then St. John is just a little bit further north. And then, for whatever reason, Allen tries to take Montreal on his own with 30 guys, 60 guys, and he ends up being captured. Yeah. So some other um, questions that I would have my students tackle at this point in time. Uh, is there any other information on those Remember Baker um, missions? And maybe Remember Baker is a good one to focus in on because he has such a memorable name. Uh, Remember Baker just as a name that anybody can sort of recall. Uh, was, it, was he with Ethan Allen when the uh, Allen Arnold stormed uh, Ticonderoga with Remember Baker? Um, I believe uh, Rem Remember Baker, the question was, was he with Ethan Allen when Arnold and Allen took Ticonderoga. Um, I believe Remember Baker is actually up here in the settled land. And the Allens send word to Baker to come to the fort. And I think he's part of the group that sort of secures Crown Point. Um, okay. And I think I was just reading that recently. Yeah, but Warner might have been right? Warner? Yes, Warner. Yeah. Uh, is there any information on the Canadian archives? If you go online, the Canadian archives are great. They've got a ton of material that has been um, digitized. Uh, the Metcalf family, Simon Metcalf's one, uh, wife's name is Catherine. He has an eight-year-old son at the time, George. Uh, I haven't even done any research on them. Uh, you mentioned genealogy, I think. Is, would it be possible to do some genealogy on the Metcalf family and see if Catherine or, or George Metcalf had any information? Going back to the Abnaki, uh, is there any oral histories that the Abnaki would have? Uh, Bayes Wells, physical geography, the men assigned to the Liberty and the Enterprise. Is there any way that we could find out the names of the guys who were on these two boats on Lake Champlain? Hmm. So this is a, a view of Missisquoi Bay. This is some of Armin's drone footage. Uh, and something, I, I can bring my students to this location. Um, this is about a mile south of the Canadian border. And it is uh, about 10 minutes from MVU. So this is one of the spy missions. This would be the view of Missisquoi during the Bayswell spy mission. You guys have seen that view. And that's Windmill Point in Albert. And my students, as a matter of fact, there's MVU faculty members that live on Windmill Point that have said that we could use their property. Man assigned to the Enterprise. Is there any way, 250 years, can we look back and find the names of the people? The answer is yes. So, uh, Northern Illinois Digital Library, they actually have documents that have been digitized which show the manifest, the crew rosters, for the men who were at least assigned to the Enterprise. And these are the men who were assigned to the Enterprise. So, this is a lot more than a, so, a social studies student in high school would want to take on. But, who knows? Maybe a student wants some extra credit, maybe they want to do a little bit of research. There's a name that they could go into Ancestry.com and they could see if there's a uh, military record. All of these individuals were either off the coast of Swan, on Isle of Mott, or very near Albert. So, and this is from uh, May to July of 75. So, um, we're at 2.52. Anybody remember who, which individual that was? Was that Simon Metcalf? That was Jacob Bailey. That was Jacob Bailey. Good. So this is our image of Jacob Bailey. This is a quote from one of Jacob Bailey's letters. And this is from Jacob Bailey uh, to George Washington. So another thing, that, another thing that I can emphasize with my students is you're not in the middle of nowhere. The place that you were raised was the content of letters between George Washington and some of the other founding fathers. So there's a road. Jacob Bailey over on the eastern side of the state wants to build a road from the Connecticut River to Missisquoi Bay. And do you remember those lines that I asked you to remember from the earlier map? Yeah. Well, this is the Metcalf map. Metcalf is the landowner up here. 
you'll notice that there's a line that kind of comes to this area here. Uh, real quick history question. I'm sure everybody knows this. What was the original name? What was the original name of the Winooski River? Oh, the Onion River. Yeah. So it, this path here, it's not really a road, comes down to the Onion River location. This one here, where does it appear to be going? Jacob Bailey yeah. is over on the eastern side of the lake. So we've got this guy, Jacob Bailey. He's mentioned on the Metcalf in Metcalf story, sort of, between Bailey and George Washington. They're talking about the road to Canada by way of the Missisquoi. It was not founded on my imagination or not south of views, which may be suggested I live near the line the road must go. So Bailey. Our picture of Bailey is telling George Washington, hey, it's possible to cut this road through the woods of Vermont. So Bailey sends his nephew. February 1776, they're going to go from an area on the eastern side of the Green Mountains. And this is the actual um, interview with Jacob Bailey's nephew. They're going to go from Barnett, or Barnett, to Swanson Falls on the Sisquoi River. They're leaving from the town of Peachum. On the second day, we proceeded five miles to Peachum Center. Excuse me. And a lot of this interview, he goes over the path that they took to get to the Sisquoi. You'll notice that Joe's Pond is referenced, yeah. the town of Woodbury. And then it says, on the fifth day, good snowshoeing, each of us took his own pack, and at night camped on the banks of the River Lamoille. The sixth day, we arrived at Metcalf's in Swan. So this is another Metcalf map. I hope this works, because I think people will enjoy this. This is the Library of Congress. And with the Library of Congress, you can blow up some of their material. Let's go to the Swanton area, if we can. This is a Metcalf map from 1777. Everybody recognize that sort of area of Swanton? Mm -hmm. That's the Missisquoi River. See the road? So this was also sort of a light bulb moment. You see how that line descends to the east? Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at where it ends up. That's in the area of Peachum and Jacob Bailey's settlement on the eastern side of uh, on the eastern side of Vermont. Now that that's not the famous Bailey Hazen Road. That's only a section of it. Hazen uh, builds another road a little bit later on in the war, but it's connected to this one and goes into a different path. Just uh, some other research questions. So in, I'll be wrapping up soon. Um, in um, this time period, the American Revolution is underway. The uh, Americans are invading Quebec. Uh, they go up through the Richelieu River area. They actually take Montreal. Uh, does anybody know what happens after they take Montreal? What city do they try to take after Montreal? Quebec, Quebec, Quebec city. city. And what happens at Quebec City? They fail miserably. Yeah. Well, Richard, Richard, the general Richard Montgomery is killed at the battles. Yep. Now, why, why that's significant, I don't know if you know this, but uh, the town of Montgomery, Vermont, is named after General Richard yep. Montgomery. Yep. So Montgomery is killed. So is Montgomery, Alabama. Yep. So after the, the same battle. Yeah. <clears throat> so is the French. Yeah. He was killed. What's that? So is the other general. Oh, in the French and Indian War, yeah. So, Arnold, command falls to Arnold. Arnold gets injured in the leg. So he's kind of taken out. The Americans lay siege to Quebec City, but it's in the middle of the winter, and they're really not able to do anything. Uh, the Americans are rushing reinforcements up through the Champlain Valley. Uh, and does anybody know why the American invasion of Quebec 
basically fails, peters out. There's two reasons. Well, well one was that the, they were hoping that the, uh, the French um, citizens of Quebec would join the, Ameri the Americans, but they never did. Right. And so there's actually three reasons. They also lost about uh, half of their uh, troops on the way up, the journey up from Maine. Yeah. Smallpox. 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 So we all live in an era where like, disease is a real threat. We're having this presentation outside because of that damn disease. Smallpox, at the time, was worse. Smallpox would completely wipe out entire regiments. One of the reasons why the American invasion of Quebec failed is because that army, uh, A, they can't deal with the British reinforcements that are coming over by ship. But a lot of the men get sick. And, um, I'll, I'll talk about that'll be one of the things I wrap up with. But um, one of the there's a company of men. Again, folks, small town Vermonter. When you learn that something that is connected to Valley Forge or Ticonderoga or Ethan Allen, when you learn that something like that happened uh, in your community, it's it, it's it's a nerd mode moment. And I, I feel really good about talking to my students. About it. So the guy who marches his company through Swanton is a guy by the name of James Osgood. James Osgood. And uh, I'll show you a little bit of a piece of candy about that in a minute. Uh, could, we, could we research any of his men? Um, has this been traced? We'll take a look at that in a second. Uh, is there any other documentation of that road? Did other units use Metcalfe's settlement? Um, what did Metcalfe sell to the Americans? Um, that's still a topic of my research, too. We don't know exactly how much Simon Metcalf sold to the Americans, but there is some indication that he did. It was probably by convenience. I don't think he wanted the American Revolution to succeed. It was just the army in place that could buy his lumber, so he sold it to them. Uh, and then did the road maybe start at Metcalf and head southeast? So just a couple of other things to show, which I think are really uh, interesting. So that guy Osgood that I mentioned uh, in the first, in, in the previous slide. Um, his company starts out from Newberry on the eastern side of Vermont, and they march through the Peachum area, Joe's Pond, Woodbury, and then they come up here on Ancestry. They actually have a list of the men who served in Osgood's regiment. So as a research vein, this is something that sometimes students get frustrated with, but sometimes they have fun with it too. We could blow up any of these names and have the students try to translate the 1700s writing. And then they could choose one of these individuals just to see if there's anything else on Ancestry about them. Uh, I haven't gotten to this point yet because I just barely discovered this maybe three or four days ago. Um, so what ends up happening to Metcalf and what ends up happening to his um, sawmill? So this is a letter that is on the website that I mentioned before. The Don't ask me why it's Northern Illinois that has all of these documents. But Friday, June 28, 1776, this is after the American invasion has failed due to smallpox. Uh, this is written by uh, Metcalf. Sorry, uh, this is a bill. Um, Thomas Thompson, Metcalf's man, is trying to get paid for the goods that Metcalf sold to the American army. So this is June 28th. This is in the records. This is a primary source document. Again, there's a picture of the sawmill before it gets burned. I don't have artwork yet of it burning, but that's one of the plans for the next book. Um, so how do I know it was burned? Uh, Pittsburgh, July 14th, 1776. This is from Captain Bronson to General Gates. Gates is the general who wins at Saratoga. As your honor gave Colonel Warner orders to send a party of men to Cisco Bay to burn Metcalf Mills, before he arrived at this post, I had sent off the men in scouting parties. So as of July 14th, we know that the American army wanted to burn Simon Metcalf's settlement. Now I'm going to go back two slides. Because he was supplying the British? But I think they were, they were worried about that. So if Simon Metcalf is here in Swanton, at some point in time during the American Revolution, Metcalf actually builds a road right here and is probably to support the Americans. But by 1776, the British are back at St. John. 
and they're fortifying St. John's. And that's where the British fleet is going to be built that defeats Arnold at Valcourt Bay. The Americans had retreated by this point in time. Would the Americans have wanted a sawmill this close to the English, just ready for them to use and buy? No. So that note from Gates to Brownson to Brownson to Gates, American soldiers were sent up to burn the sawmill. The problem is we don't know when. There's no primary source documentation of when that happened. And we know it was burned um, because of, oh, by the way, I, I was able to find the uh, list of soldiers who are in Captain Brownson's company. If they were the ones to burn it, maybe there's a primary source document from one of these individuals, but I haven't been able to find it yet. So uh, this is from Simon Metcalf to Jacob Bailey, dated Prattsburg. So remember, I said Prattsburg is basically Swanton, July 21st of 1776. They mentioned the Onion River. Metcalf mentions that he had been arrested by the Americans um, and that he's looking for his apprentice, Thomas Thompson. We see his name again. But you notice he's writing from Prattsburg. He doesn't mention that the sawmill has been burned yet. It seems like he would have mentioned that to Jacob Bailey if the sawmill had been burned. But then we'll fast forward a little bit, and this is close to where I'm going to wrap up. So this is from an American colonel to General Gates. Again, this is the primary source document. Honored sir, the young man Thompson, who is a clerk of Mr. Metcalf, and the Frenchman, Anthony Gerard, arrived here last night. This is in the area of Crown Point. So you don't have to read the rest of that paragraph unless you really, really want to. Go down to the bottom of that paragraph. Metcalf's Where is a specific reference? If I didn't copy and paste that specific reference, I'm going to be really disappointed to myself, with myself. Anyway. Later in this particular letter, sorry about that, later in this particular letter, this letter from Colonel Hartley mentions that Metcalf's Mills has been burnt in Swan. Do we know, can we say for certain that it was the Americans that did it? Probably. But later on, uh, Metcalf testifies that he thought the British did it, so we really don't know. Oh, here we go. I did this. The sooner they are removed from hence, the better. Metcalf's Mill has been burnt. He lives within five leagues of St. John's. He's undoubtedly against us at present. That's the American leadership saying uh, this sawmill has been burned. Metcalf's probably not with us anymore. So one final thing. Uh, I'm still researching for the book that I'm writing uh, on northern Vermont in the American Revolution. The Fort Ticonderoga has a gem of a primary source. It's called Simon Metcalf's Little Book. And it's a journal written by Simon Metcalf. And I, I don't think I should sh uh, show anything that hasn't been published. I'll, I'll just show you some things that have shown up in some other books. At least I thought I was going to show you some things. Uh, I guess that's a heck of a tease. So that's the cover of Simon Metcalf's journal. Um, and basically, Fort Ticonderoga, um, they, took, they digitized it um, for their own purposes and then sent me a draft of it. And in that, um, the journal is from that period of the 1780s. It's not during the Revolutionary War, it's shortly afterward, but still, it's a gold mine as far as research is concerned. So, so I just want to finish up by saying, as a history teacher, um, it is really important for me to make connections with my students. And a lot of my students live around the Missisquoi River. They live within walking distance of Missisquoi Bay. To be able to show them that where they live and grow up, where they throw a football, where they play their video games, is a location that is di directly connected to uh, George Washington, some of the other founding fathers, and the entire revolution is, is really mm -hmm. interesting. I guess I'll finish with a question. I mentioned Ben Franklin earlier. Do any of you know how Ben Franklin is connected with Northern Vermont and the Revolutionary War. Well, he did. He did make a trip during the Revolutionary War from Philadelphia up to Montreal. Yeah. And he comes up to Fort Ticonderoga, gets on a boat, and then they row. He spends a night basically off the coast of Isle of Mont, goes right past Alberg, and he's part of the um, commission that's evaluating whether or not the French Canadians are going to join the American Revolution. Benedict, uh, sorry, not Benedict, Ben Franklin 
is up there for like two days, and he's like, no, nope, there's no way the French Canadians are going to support the revolution. And as I remember, I think, I think one of the people came, came with him was John Carroll. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think he was the Catholic, though. Yeah, he was a Catholic, and that, that's pretty much why he brought him, also because he was from the Carroll family. Yeah. I think uh, if, if you... Or Chase, maybe Chase was a Catholic. Uh, I, uh, I think if you... Uh, I think the Carroll the Carol family, I think what was, me was mentioned in the movie American Treasure, mm. or else I kind of made the connection or something like that, but I think the Carroll family was mentioned in, uh, in America, uh, or National Treasure. So uh, that's book three. Uh, I'm writing it right now. Uh, the uh, first draft is due to the History Press in January. Um, Northern Vermont and the Ameri uh, War of 1812 has been out for a little while. Uh, I do have a couple copies that I'm selling, not for myself. Uh, I wouldn't make uh, much money. Uh, I'll be totally honest. Uh, I've only made about $400 from the books that I've published. Uh, <clears throat> the History Press tells local authors that in order for them to make, in order for them to make a profit, they have to sell about 700 copies in the first year. So, if any of you know what the Elephant Page is, it's a bookstore up in Franklin County. I've brought copies of the Hidden History of Franklin County. If any of you want to buy one, uh, there wouldn't be any tax. Donna said that she would eat the tax on the purchase. I won't make any money from it. I'll bring the cash right up to Donna. So. I'm just doing that for a favor for her. Any questions to finish up? I just wanted a comment to tie it in with the times that, you know, that the Washington, because of the smallpox ravaging his troops, insisted that all his troops be vaccinated. Mm. So there was, was a universal order. And at the time, it was, it was not a popular thing because no. they didn't know no. really what was going on. And some commanding officers said, okay, vaccinate my unit. Vaccinate's the wrong word. I think it was inoculate my unit. Yeah, yeah. And they didn't want the other officers to know. So they would slit in between the toes. And they would put a little bit of smallpox. Have you guys seen John Adams? The HBO series John Adams? Yeah. There's a really awesome, I shouldn't say awesome, but there's a really <laughs> neat scene in there where they're trying to treat smallpox and the Adams family gets the inoculation. Any other questions? Wasn't it Cotton Mather? Wasn't his name Cotton Mather out of Boston that tried out the smallpox vaccination on his son? And then. Um, I, I don't know the specific name, okay. but a, a lot of people that was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They weren't sure. Franklin didn't vaccinate his own son. Mm. Yes. Where did you find the Metcalf maps? I've seen one of them, but I just can't remember where. So um, the one that had the line on it going through the green spine mountains? of the Green Mountains, that's okay. at the Library of Congress. Oh, okay. So, so if you type in Library of Congress okay. and type in Metcalf, yep. a couple documents will pop up, but that map will be accessible and you can blow it up to see yourself. Are they under Metcalf or are they sometimes under Metcalf? Uh, so the question is, is it Metcalf or Metcalf? Um, you probably would have success just typing in Metcalf, M-E-T, Metcalf. Okay. Uh, and then the other one is one that hasn't been published and that's why it was kind of grainy. The Bennington Museum actually owns that map that had Prattsburg up here in the, it was okay. sort of a grainy one with the lines off it. So those are the two that I know of and the two that I use. But that's a research topic that I'd like to, he was a map maker, so the chances are he did more. Any other questions? Anybody want to chat about the revolution? Right, anybody wants to talk to Dre, you can, you'll be around and you can have your book, so. be on our way. First of all, uh, I don't know if it was mentioned at the beginning, but we do have town meeting television here recording this talk, so you can tell uh, some of your friends that it will be available. It will be shown on on uh, Burlington's, uh, on, on their uh, channel, but we also will have the link so you can watch, anybody who's watching this on their computer, it's thanks to the town meeting television who recorded these for us, so we thank you for that. We will be having a book discussion in probably late September, maybe early October. And we're going to use the new book that came out about two months ago on Ebenezer Allen, Ethan's cousin, and uh, Glenn Fay, who did the introduction today, is the author of this book. So uh, if you're interested, we do have copies here if you'd like to get a head start to read this and consider joining our book club. It's going to be done over Zoom, so you'll be able to uh, participate from home. Okay, that'll be coming up. 
Now, in September, we normally have our talk on the third Sunday of the month, as we are doing it today. But in September, we are hosting a veterans town meeting here on site. So our talk for September will be on the fourth Sunday of the month. I think that's September 29th. And the speaker for that talk, while he's making his way forward right now, uh, Liam McCone is going to be the speaker, and he will be talking about Finian's Raid. And if you would like to just one or two, you know, just a very few remarks, so we want them to come back for it. Right, right. right. So, so Liam. It's a tough act to follow after Mr. Barney here. So, Mahu, as we say in, in the Irish, well done. <laughs> Good on you. Uh, I hope you're inspiring the, the youngsters to take your, of your passion for history because uh, uh, you're doing the kind of thing that, that I think would pique their interest in take them out in the field. So, did you say the 29th? I thought it was the 20th. The fourth, the fourth the Sunday in Saturday September. Day. I don't know. I don't have a check the calendar. The, the 26th. Yeah. Is that the 26th, yeah. perhaps? But it's it's, right. it'll be the fourth Sunday. Okay. Consistent. So, we'll be plowing some of the same territory as today's talk, but a, little, a later era. And uh, 1866 and 1870, the Irish invaded Canada. Uh, in 1866, there was no Canada, and it was formed somewhat in reaction to the to the attack by the Fenian Brotherhood. So, be happy to discuss any of that uh, with anybody after. You, uh, it sounds like material for another uh, student for the students of the Sisquare to get involved with, also. <laughs> so, yeah. we're, we're looking at roads you know, that the Irish took to go up there, so you're. Your demonstration of tracing roads. Is very so it sounds like it's a perfect follow-up to the talk today. So, did you find the date in September? Twenty-six. The twenty-six. Okay, so Sunday the twenty-six. All right, and if they're on our mailing list, you will be getting the notices on that. We do put it out in seven days and so forth. Thank you, Liam. Okay. And finally, just to let you know, I will be taking a few folks up to the house on a tour. So, if any of you have not uh, done a tour recently and would like to join us, you could do that. We're going to meet up in the lobby in about two minutes, okay? So, all right, thank you all for coming. By the way, the, the other thing I want to mention is I'm always impressed with the uh, the knowledge of the people who come here for talks. I mean, you guys had very, uh, very good questions and responses to the questions that were posed. So it's amazing to know, it's encouraging to see what, what folks know about our, our history here. So thank you for coming, and I hope you'll keep uh, being involved with us here at the homestead. Thank you.